We're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 28. If you would, please stand in honor of God's word. We are now into full force, the kings of the divided kingdom. And uh, for many folks, they've not been through a Bible study like this in church. You, you're not used to hearing this from the pulpit of a, of, of a teaching like this. So I hope that, you know, you'll make plans to continue being here. Take notes, bring a notebook. And, uh, you know, because God said everything in the Old Testament is giving to us for examples in the New Testament of how we should be living for the Lord. And it's good examples and bad examples. So listen to this. And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing the young man, that he was industrious, he made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. It came to pass at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahah, the Shilonite, found him in the way and he had himself clad with a new garment and they were two alone in the field. And Ahiah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it in 12 pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, take the 10 pieces for thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel. Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give 10 tribes to thee. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Father, we thank you for this privilege and the honor of coming into your house and just opening your wonderful word and allowing it to wash over us, to soak into our heart, God, to teach us, sometimes to make us laugh, sometimes to make us weep. Sometimes we can identify it with, with it, Lord, and other times we just need it in our heart to teach other, other folks in discipleship. God, I pray that you'd be with those that aren't here with us tonight. I pray that you'll be with those that have been in the hospital, that have been hurting. Uh, please be with uh, Bill Watson. And I thank you, God, that he's doing better. I pray that you'll continue to watch over our friend. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'll be with those that are grieving the loss of loved ones. God, be with our choir as they are rehearsing tonight. I thank you for them and for their great talent and their willingness to lay that talent on the altar of sacrifice. I thank you, O oh God, for uh, our, our student ministry. I pray, God, that you'll be with Andrew and Heather as they are teaching our youth discipleship now. I pray, God, that you'll be with our children's ministry as they are going through summer activities and missions. And, and Lord Jesus, that you'll be with our nursery workers as they take care of our babies. And, God, just be with everybody on campus. I thank you for those that are doing safety committee and God, that are watching out for our safety, I pray, God, that you'll just watch over every aspect, set holy angels over this campus. God, protect us as only you can, and we will give you glory and praise, for it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Uh, this is the first time we're going to study tonight the, the king of Israel, Jeroboam, okay? And we're going to look at Jeroboam, and then we're going to come back and look at Rehoboam some more. But Jeroboam, this is kind of a funny story because... Uh, Jeroboam, the Bible says, is very industrious, very hard worker. Man, he's just got a task, and, and, and he's like a little bulldog, and he's doing a great job, and he's a great man of valor. He's very brave, and, and everything's going great, so much so that King Solomon notices him and goes, you know, that guy's really a good worker, and I'm really impressed with him, and, and, and I'm going to give him a promotion. So he gives him a promotion over the tribes of, of, of Joseph, which y'all know Joseph uh, split basically and went Ephraim and Manasseh and a very large part of Israel in the north kingdom was taken up by Ephraim and Manasseh because they were the major, I mean, huge land masses. So he says, I'm going to make him governor over the tribes of Joseph. We'll give him a promotion. And the funny part is, he, he, Jeroboam, man, he's excited because he goes and buys him a brand new suit. Man, he's got him a three-piece suit. He's gone down to Dillard's and he's got him a good one. And, and, and back in those days, you realize that, that clothing was extremely expensive, very labor-intensive. This was something that you would pass down for generations. It's something that you would will to your children. I, I'm going to give them this piece of cloth because that cloth was so expensive. They had to cut it off the sheep and they had to hand uh, twill it into, in, in, into threads and then take that thread onto a loom and make it into cloth and then take the cloth and make it into uh, some type of a garment. Very difficult, not easy at all. 
And here he was, got in a brand new suit. Walking around the field. Looking good. And the Bible says the preacher comes up to him and says, hey, man, that's a nice coat. Let me see that coat. So he goes, here, yeah, I, it is. I, I, I got this at Jacques Penet, and uh, it, it was just, you know, man, I, I, I saw it, and I had to have it, and I just got a raise, and I got a promotion. And the preacher goes, that is so nice, and then goes, and, and tears it in half. Jeroboam's going, what are you doing? And he proceeds to tear it into 12 pieces. His brand new suit, 12 pieces. Your boy's going, man, you've lost your mind. What if I came up to you on Sunday and pulled your coat off your back and just started putting my foot on it and just tearing it into 12 pieces? You'd think our preacher's lost his mind. And then he says, all right, I'm gonna give you 10 pieces. And this is the Lord's way of saying I will give you 10 tribes. I will tear them out of the hand of Solomon. You're going to get 10 of the 12 tribes. So Solomon hears about this. And he understands that a prophet of God has given this prophecy to Jeroboam. And, and he's like, well, we'll see about that. And Solomon puts a price on the head of Jeroboam and says, I'll kill him. I fire him and I'm going to kill him if I get a hold of him. And the Bible says that Jeroboam goes down to the southern kingdom of Egypt and there he will be in exile until he hears of the death of Solomon. And this will come into play later on. So now let's jump back to Rehoboam, who is the son of Solomon and is the king over Judah. Now, you'll remember, after Solomon dies, Rehoboam goes to Shechem, and he's going to be crowned as the king of all of Israel. But he's met there by the leaders of the tribes, and he's actually met there by Jeroboam, who is the leader. And they say, now listen, will you lower the taxes a little bit that your father put on us? Because he's put a heavy burden on our shoulder. And if you will lower the taxes, we will be a servant to you forever. We'd love to have you as king. But these taxes are eating our lunch. Please lower the taxes. So Rehoboam goes to his older counselors. He says, what do you think I ought to do? And they say, well, if you're smart, you'll lower the taxes a little bit. If you're smart, you'll speak kindly to those people and you will humble yourself and become a great servant to them. Be kind. Put yourself in their shoes. They're saying, listen, you're richer than J. Paul Getty. Come on, man. These poor old farmers, they're just barely making a living. And you've got taxes on them so high, lower the taxes a little bit. But the Bible says that Rehoboam listened to the counsel of his younger counselors who basically said, Listen, you waited all your life to be king. You waited all this time to be the big boss. Now be the big boss. Be the, be the boss. Be the king. You show them who's in charge. Get tough. And when Rehoboam answers roughly, then the Bible says the ten northern tribes rebel. Now we talked about that on Sunday. Y'all remember all that, amen? Good. So three significant events in Rehoboam. First, Rehoboam goes to Jerusalem and he gathers up an army of 180,000 men in response to the northern kingdom rebelling. His intent was to invade the northern tribes and to make them live under his rule. I'll make you serve me. I will make you make me the king. And through a prophet, the Bible says in 1 Kings 12, 22, but the word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, you need to speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and unto all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the remnant of the people, saying, thus saith the Lord, you shall not go up. 
you shall not fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing is from me. And they hearkened, therefore, to the word of the Lord. Return to depart according to the word of God. God would not allow Rehoboam to attack his cousins to the north over his arrogance and over his selfishness. Think about this. Rehoboam lost almost everything for his failure to humble himself. His pride and his arrogance cost him the kingdom. A simple failure to show compassion. You would be surprised, dear friend, how many times I've had men come into my office that have lost their home and their family over a failure to humble themselves. I'm the boss. I gave her an ultimatum. And she took it. (laughs) Now how do I get her back? (laughs) I'm going, first of all, you got to take your big foot out of your mouth. We are called, man, listen to me. I'm I'm not saying turn into a sissy. I'm not. The buck's got to stop somewhere. But God has called us to be servant leaders. True servant leaders. Matthew 18, 4, Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He says, you want to be great? The least of those here are going to be the greatest in heaven. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. I guess he knows what he's talking about. James 4.10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. 1 Peter 5.5, 5, 5, likewise you younger submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject to one another and be clothed with humility for God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore into the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time Casting all your care upon him for a care of you. The, the, the thing God loves of us is the humble spirit to become a servant, to quit getting so arrogant and puffed up and wanting to be the big ball. So first thing he did is he refused to humble himself. Second, instead of becoming a godly leader, Rehoboam now leads the country into vile wickedness. Listen to 1 Kings 14, 22. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked God to jealousy with their sins, which they committed above all that their fathers had done. Verse 23, for they also built them high places and images and groves on every hill and under every green tree. And there was also sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations that were Uh, which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Rehoboam's mother was from Ammon. We know that. The the national god of Ammon was Molech. We talked about that. And, And it seems that Rehoboam tries to get the entire country to follow the wickedness that his mother had taught him. And therefore, all throughout the land, they're reverting back to Canaanism. Understand something. Rehoboam was 41 when he takes the throne. Solomon reigned for how many years? 40. So Rehoboam was one year old when Solomon began to reign. When the temple was finished building, it took about 20 years to build the temple that in, in all its foundation and building and everything. So, so that when fire came down and consumed the altar, when the Shekinah glory of God came in and indwelt the holy place, when revival broke out and people saw this wonderful manifestation of holy God, Rehoboam is 20 years old. He's seen this. He's seen revival. He's seen the hand of God. And still he turns toward Molech. Verse 23, for they also built them high places and images and groves on every hill and under every green tree. Well, what is a high place? Well, the, the definition in the Hebrew is an Asherah, an Asherah pole. Uh, this was addressed in Exodus 34. The Bible said, take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whether they goest, 
lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But you shall destroy their altars, break down their images, and cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, he is a jealous God. In Deuteronomy 16, the Bible says that they were instructed to cut down the Asherah poles. Uh, in, in Judges, we remember Gideon, uh, that great hero. Uh, one of the things that showed his bravery was he, he cut down his father's Asherah pole. Like got in a lot of trouble for it too. But he had the bravery to cut down his father's Asherah pole. So what is an Asherah pole? Well, we're not totally positive. We have some ideas. Number one, it could be like an obelisk which is a very, very crude object of male fertility. Could be like a totem pole that has ancestors that they worship. Sometimes it would be like a tree. They would plant an Asherah tree for the specific purpose of worshiping that tree, that pole. Asherah sometimes is a reference to the queen of heaven, and they would say, this is, this is the consort of El, El being God. This is God's wife. This is God's concubine. This is who God has sex with. So they perverted the image of Almighty God and brought in this element of sexuality and, and began to worship her, and God hated it. He hated it. Um, and, and anytime you saw revivals take place, the Asherah poles would get destroyed. And anytime you saw the nation turn toward wickedness, the Asherah poles were getting put back up. Images are idols. They're stone statues that depict gods or items that were worshipped, uh, often accompanied with groves. Altars were places of sacrifice that were not in the temple and that were not sanctioned by God. It's where people would sacrifice different things to different gods, oftentimes up on high places on, on the hill so they get closer to heaven. And as a result, sexual perversion and sodomy abounded in the land. The Bible says that, that there were sodomites throughout the land. And, and, and we know that that is a term that comes from those people doing the uh, wicked, perversion, perverted behavior of Sodom and Gomorrah. And they, that, that it was so pervasive that it was termed a sodomite. And, and that's what they are. They're sodomites, those who are perverted sexually in some shape, form, or fashion. And it's easy to see how this type of sin spreads like a virus. And how far it's come simply in my lifetime is just amazing even the terminology that we have, from a homosexual lifestyle to a transgender to a I'm not sure what I am to a LGBTQTAIA. So, so I guess the official term, get this, in the United States, now this is, it, 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 we, we kind of laugh, but it's, it's very serious in, in the wickedness of the United States of America. It's a LGBTQIA. The L stands for a lesbian, two women that burn in their lust for one another. That's what the Bible says that those who have a reprobate mind will do. Gay, that doesn't mean happy. So lesbian, gay, bisexual, that's, I'll do it all in different. Transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, asexual. And that's just the basics of perversion. Those are official titles. I'm not making this stuff up. That's in the United States today. And y'all are very aware of that. And 20 years ago, we didn't even know what that stuff meant. The Bible said when they turned their back on God, that sodomites began to multiply in the land. Third and First Kings fourteen twenty five, the Bible says Judah is invaded in the fifth year of his reign, the reign of Rehoboam by the Egyptians and the leadership of Shishak. That's First Kings fourteen twenty five. So, what 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 we get from this is okay. Rehoboam goes in. He's arrogant. He's snotty. He's he he thinks he knows everything, and and they're having groves and idols all over the place. That the way that you worship in them is with sexual perversion. 
You'd go and you would find a temple prostitute or, or you would commit acts of homosexuality and that's how you worship these wicked entities. And instead of discouraging it, he encouraged it. And God, I believe, when Rehoboam took the throne, he had five years. God gave him five years to get your act together before he would send in the sword of his wrath and they did not get their act together. In fact, they got worse, and God allowed an Egyptian invasion to come and invade Judah. Judah did not use that time wisely. So the thought that comes to my head is, is God giving us time to prepare for his return? Are we using our time wisely He's delaying his return. He's delaying that last period of time. Are we using this time wisely? What if somebody came in tomorrow to take your Bible away? Do you have any verses memorized? Have you prepared for this? Are we going to be caught completely blindsided? They had five years. They did not use that time wisely. I think back to Joseph, one of our heroes in the Old Testament. The Bible said, God said, all right, I'm going to give you seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. You got seven years to provide, to prepare. Get ready. What well, if he going, ah, I don't know. He just starved. Second thing is the plan of Solomon Solomon, his father, was to marry the daughter of Pharaoh. You remember one of his first wives? He went down and married the daughter of Pharaoh. And the reason we believe he did it is because he wanted to make an alliance with his southern border and, and, and to say, listen, if I marry this princess of, of, of Egypt, of Pharaoh's daughter, man, I'll be in good with Pharaoh. And man, this will work good. And, 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 and politically, that sounds real good, doesn't it? Until you realize God says you're not supposed to marry foreigners. But, but it's a political alliance. Well, that's great. So what happens when Shishak overthrows the Pharaoh? Huh. Now your friend is the enemy of the new leader that makes you his enemy too. So Shishak does not like Judah, because Judah was in an alliance with the enemy of Shishak. So when Shishak gets an opportunity, he's going to lead an army of Ethiopians and Libyans and Cushites up from Africa that will completely decimate Judah. So Shishak invades with a huge army, and the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 12, 3, he came with 1,200 chariots, 60,000 horses, and countless army of foot soldiers, including Libyans and Sukkites and Ethiopians. And Shishak con conquered Judah's fortified towns, then advanced to attack Jerusalem. But remember something, guys. It's never the size of the army. It's the fact that God had taken his hand of protection off the land. All the bombs and tanks in the world will not save you if God takes down the hedge of protection around you, your family, or this nation. So I'm going to say that one more time because that was so rich and so wise that certainly people would say amen to something that good. All the bombs and tanks in the world will not save you if God takes down the hedge of protection around you, around your family, or around your country. If God ever takes his hand off of us, we're, we're free game. Shishak strips the temple treasury in the nation of all the wealth that Solomon accumulated. All this time, Solomon got richer and richer and richer and richer. He said, oh, I got all my money. I got all my stuff, all this sort of stuff. And in one fell swoop, the Bible says Shishak comes in, takes it all. Like a Kirby vacuum cleaner. Got it. And it's, and it's illustrated through the golden shields because the Bible says that Solomon was so rich that his guards, his temple guards that guarded the temple 
carried golden shields made out of gold. Now, that's not the best metal for a shield, but what that does is that shows your prosperity. That shows your wealth. You've taken the most wealthy, precious metal in the world and said, we're going to use it as a shield. I will drink out of golden cups. I will eat off of golden plates. And Shishak came and took it all. And we know that as a replica, Rehoboam said, oh, I lost my gold shields. So he made brass shields to look like gold shields so that when dignitaries would come, they would pull them out of the treasury and show them and then run back in before anybody figured out they were really not made of gold. It's fake. Isn't that, isn't that kind of like some churches though? That at one time, man, they were full of the Holy Ghost and, 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 and God was doing things and people were getting saved and people were getting excited and it was just thrilling. And, and, and it wasn't because you had great music and it wasn't because you had great preaching. It was because God was there and you recognized the unseen presence of God. And when you walked in, it's almost like the Holy Spirit just grabbed hold of you and went, wow, man, this is something special. But when a church turns away from the Lord and quits preaching the word of God and quits making prayer a fundamental part of, of, of everything that they do, then the glory of the Lord will depart and, and you got to come up with something to fake it. And you go through the motions, but you're missing the vital part of God being there. And this is fakery. They got fake shields. They're no longer gold shields or fake shields. They're trying to fake it. They're trying to show people, well, we are prosperous too. No, you're not. No, you're not. Now, when Shishak comes in, the Bible indicates at this point that the prophet comes to him and says, listen, they're, they're going to wipe you out if you don't humble yourself. And finally, Rehoboam and the leaders humble themselves. Now, it didn't last long. It was a foxhole conversion the bullets are flying and, and arrows are going and, and they say, man, you better, you, you, you better humble yourself. Okay, okay, I'll do anything, God. Yes, 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 I'll do anything. And God goes, all right. And he allows them not to be completely consumed and taken over by the Egyptians. But it didn't last long. They'll forget the promise they made at the altar. They'll forget the promise they made to their wife or to their husband or to the Lord. Hence, listen to the summary of the last days of Rehoboam in 2 Chronicles 12, 13. So King, y'all got that? 2 Chronicles 12, 13, chapter 12, verse 13. So King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned, for Rehoboam was one in 40 years when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. His mother's name was Namah and Ammonitus, and he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. If you had a thesis statement of the life of Rehoboam, this would be it in verse 14. He did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. True discipleship and Christianity is not genetic. I did not get it from my mother and my father. Just because my aunt and uncle, I mean my uncles were bald-headed, I became bald-headed. Christianity didn't work like that. It's not an involuntary emotion that I had no choice over that just hit me and I had to become the preacher. It is your conscious choice to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Every day that you wake up, you make that conscious decision of your own volition to say, I will seek the Lord. I choose to follow the Lord. I will obey the Lord. Irregardless of what anybody else does, I choose to obey the Lord. That is my conscious decision. It's not a wave of emotion that hits me once in a while. It's my decision. I choose to. Psalm 27, 7 is one of my favorite scriptures. It says, hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy upon me and answer me. When thou saidest, seek you my face. 
My heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. I made up my mind in my own heart. I'm going to seek the Lord's face because he told me to seek his face. It's a matter of the will, putting my desires into action. Mixed with a bowl full of determination and humility. We prepare for an occupation. Oftentimes going to years and years of university and postgraduate school. We prepare our kids for school. I love to see the pictures of all the kiddos that have the little lunchbox, little backpack, dressed up, carrying little plaques. My parents pull up, shove us out the door, <laughs> take off. <laughs> so I hope you can find your way home. <laughs> we prepare for emergencies. We all have flashlights at home. We have fire extinguishers at home. We have fire alarms at home. We prepare for emergencies and have maybe some bottles of water in case the water gets turned off or something. We prepare for retirement. You put money into retirement saying, you know, one of these days I'm going to be too old to do this. And you put money aside and, and, and you wisely set up an account. We prepare for marriage. We, we, we go do marriage counseling and hopefully we read some books about how to be a good husband or good wife. And, and, and we prepare for children. Amen. We should prepare our hearts to seek the Lord. We should be prepared to hear the God's will. So that's Rehoboam. He did evil because he prepared not his heart to serve the Lord, to seek the Lord's face. So we go back to Jeroboam now, okay? We're going to get a little bit of Jeroboam in, in the last 15 minutes. First Kings chapter 12, when Rehoboam speaks harshly to the people, the kingdom divides, it splits. Ten tribes go north, they become Israel, and they anoint Jeroboam as the new king. This is the guy that had the new suit, got it tore off of him, torn into 12 pieces, and goes down to Egypt. When he finds out Solomon has died, he leaves Egypt and comes back to Shechem. He is there at the inauguration of Rehoboam. He's the spokesman. He's the one that says, listen, if you will lower the taxes, we'll serve you. And Rehoboam answers unwisely. So now everybody picks up Jeroboam on their shoulders, parades him around, says, we got a new king, we got a new king. And he becomes the king. And God is very specific of saying, I'm the one that gave you that kingdom. You are now the king over the ten nations of Israel because I gave that to you. It's not by luck. It's not by chance. It's not by political intrigue. I gave you that position. Do you understand? I gave that to you. Could have given it to anybody. I gave it to you. Verse 25, then Jeroboam, this is chapter 12 of 1 Kings. And Jeroboam built Shechem and Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein and went from thence and bit, built Penuel. Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn against their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Jeroboam forgets that God had given him this kingdom and he does a couple of foolish acts which are against the Lord who gave him the kingdom. First, he leads his kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel, to break their relationship with Jehovah God. Did you hear what he said? He said, my goal is I don't want these people to return to the house of David. That, that's the house of the Messiah. The Messianic lineage would come through the house of David. No, no, no. Don't turn away from David. Against Rehoboam, but not the house of David. No, no, that's like saying, I want them to turn away from God. Because God's plan would come through the house of David. Jeroboam is thinking, listen, if these Jews go back to Jerusalem, as God had commanded, and start 
observing the Passover or the Feast of Tabernacles or if they go back and do Pentecost and, 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 and celebrate the feast that God had told them, oh no, oh no, they'll kill me. They won't come back. They're going to experience revival. Oh no. And then they won't like me. They'll like God. See, he thought it's one or the other. He said either they'll like me or they'll like God, but they can't like us both. So he offers an alternative. He strategically places idols of burnt offering temples at strategic locations in Israel. 1 Kings 12, 28, whereupon the king took counsel and he made two calves of gold and said unto them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin for the people. Went to worship before the one even unto Dan. And he made a house of high places and made priests of the lowest people which were not the sons of Levi because the sons of Levi wouldn't have anything to do with it. They came down south to Jerusalem to work in the real temple. And, and, and the Bible says he took the lowest of the low, the sorriest in, in, the, in society to become the priest at these two places. So what does he do? Well, uh, if you look at the northern kingdom of Israel, to the north is Dan, up north of Caesarea Philippi. And, and, and to the southern border is Bethel. So he, he's putting obstacles north and south so that if you say, well, I, I want to go up here to worship, he says, I'm, I'm going to cut you off at Dan. Or if you say, I'm going to go south down to Jerusalem, he's going to say, I'm going to cut you off in Bethel so that you just go there. You don't have to go all the way to Jerusalem. Why would you go all the way to Jerusalem? You can walk five miles versus 50 miles. Don't go to Jerusalem. Just stay here. You want to worship? You can worship here. It's a whole lot more fun here anyway. Get to have sex with a prostitute if you worship here. We're going to have a big feast. We're going to get drunk. You don't get to do that in Jerusalem. And the Bible says he made two calves of gold. So where did he get that from? Egypt. He just came back from Egypt. This is the same golden calf that Aaron would fashion when Moses is up on Mount Sinai. And, and, and Moses came down and he was so fury, infuriated that he took the original Ten Commandments and threw them down and broke them because they were worshiping the golden calf. They just come out of Egypt. They said, we want to go back to Egypt. Let's, let's, let's worship the gods of Egypt. And that was the golden calf. God hated the golden calf, the worship of the golden calf. What it was, in essence, was the worship of the apis bull. A-P-I-S, apis bull. You can look it up on the internet if you want to. Uh, it was a specific bull. They, they would even, they, they had the national bull of, of Egypt that when this bull died, they would mummify the bull and put it into a sarcophagus or sarcophagus or whatever the thing's called. Because they looked at it as being godlike, and they would search the country for the next one, and it was a great search. And when they finally found the next apis bull, then, then the whole country celebrated, and, and that bull may live for 20, 25 years. And then when it died, they would go through the same thing. And it was known because in between its horns would have like a golden shield that was like the glory of, of its godhood. Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, Jesus talks to the church at Pergamos, and he says, To the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and I know where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and you have not denied my faith, even in those days where in Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. So what, what, what was taking place in Pergamos was it was called the uh, throne of Zeus. Very familiar place, 
uh, of ancient architecture. In fact, it was taken by Hitler and moved to Berlin, Germany. And it was a place of, of idolatry and wickedness. And the way that they would worship is they had a bull, a, a, a bull that was hollowed out on the inside. And they took this faithful martyr who was Antipas. This is what history says, Antipas. And they, and they would take others in there. And, and, and what they would do is they would put them inside this bull and the hollow belly of it and close it up. And then they would stoke a fire underneath it. And, and the mouth had a whole opening of the bull so that when the person inside began to roast and to cook inside this bull, he would begin to moan and groan. And, and you could hear it coming out of the mouth of this bull. Of, ah, because you're, there's a fire up underneath this metal bull. And you're inside of it. And you're literally cooking inside this book. And this faithful believer, our brother in Christ, Antipas, was cooked alive inside the belly of a bull in the temple of Zeus, the throne of Zeus at Pergamos. Uh, this is... Wickedness personified. And what they had done is they had set up golden calves or the worship of the apis bull in Bethel and in Dan. God sent a prophet there and he decried that altar. He said it will be torn to pieces in the future by a king named Josiah. And ground into powder. I decry what you're doing here. You're stopping people from coming to the worship of God at the temple in Jerusalem. And it's pagan idolatry. How dare you stop it? You need to stop it. And Jeroboam jumped up and said, how dare you? You can't do that. And when he stuck his finger out, God withered his hand. It just went. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, get my hand back. I want my hand. But Sam, that's in the olden days, boy. I tell you what, man, I'm glad we don't have to deal with that stuff now. Amen. A few years back, if you're familiar with the Super Bowl halftime, Madonna that witch, and I'm, I'm not, I, I truly believe she is, provided the entertainment wearing the horns of an apis bull. The most watched entertainment program in the United States of America, being entertained by a character wearing the horns of an apis bull. You may be saying, she was just in costume. Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. She knew exactly what she was doing. She knew exactly what she was wearing. I just heard that the official music in the halftime show for the future has been turned over into the hands of that wonderful moral individual, Jay-Z. It amazes me how anybody can still support the National Football League. What does it take? Tell me, as a prophet, what does it take for us to finally, as a church, go, I'm not watching that stuff anymore. They're not getting into my advertisement dollars. I'm not watching it. They, they, they kneel during our national anthem while our soldiers are standing there blowing taps and raising the flag of the United States of America, they're kneeling in disrespect. What does it take? What does it take? How much longer until the church stands up so we're not going to watch it anymore? We're not going to watch it anymore. No, no, no. It's not the same stuff we watched in the 60s. Well, Sam, you can't decry. That's fine. You better watch your hand. 
Because when the prophet stood and said, listen, I want to tell you something about this bull right here. That's of the devil. And when you put that as your highlight for the halftime show, I just think it's dangerous. So the question comes, where do we take the stand? Now, we're going to quit here because God's going to judge Jeroboam for the idol. And uh, he, he, he's going to take care of this, as, as he oftentimes does. But, but the sad thing is, Jeroboam had a wonderful, great opportunity to be the king and could have led Israel down a godly path if he'd chosen to. But he said, listen, I don't think they can love me and God at the same time. Do you know a lot of people's families are like that now? I don't know that my wife, she goes to church, she just loves that church. How can she love that church and love me? She should be a better wife because she's going there. We should love our spouses even that much more because we are in love with Jesus Christ. It's not an either or, it's a both, amen? Okay, I gotta, I'm done. Okay, I'm finished.